So we're talking this week, we're getting into a sequence in the books of, of, of the Mibar um, that goes with an escalating series of revolts against Moses. Okay. Uh, and it, 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 it turns into, I mean, it escalates and it, cul excuse me, it culminates in a couple weeks time when he hits the rock and is told you can't go into the land of Egypt. Uh, land of Egypt. Uh, yeah. Can't go into the land of Israel. Sorry. Okay. Um, and, and so that is, um, that is really devastating for Moses, but what happens um, before then you have a, an escalating series of uh, personal uh, because you have the, the, the revolt that we're going to talk about here. Uh, you have where his sister gossips against him. Uh, you have the revolt of the spies. Uh, you have the revolt of Korah. Um, and, and it just continues, continues, continues to escalate. So we're going to look a little bit at the reaction Moses has, okay? The reaction that he has. Um, and, and look and see what it means to someone to be a prophet and what that entails. Um, but also, oops, that was weird. Did you hear it? Sorry, my computer muted for a second. Um, and also uh, what it, uh, the reaction that Moses has. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background, this is, I didn't, I didn't want to put the whole thing in the study sheet, but um, this is the beginning of this reaction, okay? Oh, Peter's here and Elizabeth Burrell is here. Welcome, Elizabeth, for your first class. Thanks, Rafi. About any point you have questions, just please let me know. All right. So, chapter eleven. All right. This is now uh, the people took to complaining bitterly before the Lord. The Lord heard there was incense and a fire broke out, and this is the model. Of what happens? Right. The Israelites do something naughty or silly or whatever, uh, and then what happens? Um, God uh, sends a plague of some sort. Moses intervenes, and everything is okay. Right. You see that happen many, many, many different times. The, the variety of the plague is is sometimes distinct. You have the snakes come, the fire come, the pestilence come, the Levites go and kill a bunch of people. It depends on how bad they messed up. Okay. In this case, a fire breaks out against them. People cried out to Moses. Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. That place was called uh, Tabarea because the fire broke out and against them. Right, right. Then this is great. The riffraff in their midst felt a gluttonous craving. Ah, uh, the riffraff, always getting ourselves into trouble, okay? Um, and the Israelites wept, and they said, if only we had meat to eat, right? We've all been there. We know we get riled up by some people, right? The riffraff, and we, and we follow along. It's sort of a mob mentality. Now, here's where it gets interesting, right? We remember the fish that we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, right? Wow, Egypt doesn't sound so bad in this description, does it? Now our gullets are shriveled. There is nothing at all, nothing but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like coriander seeds and the people go out, blah, 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 blah. This is what they do with it. Okay. Moses heard the people weeping every clan apart, each person at the entrance of his tent. The Lord was very angry and Moses was distressed. So God is angry, Moses is distressed. And here we come to our, uh, what we're going to talk about, right? By Yomer Moshe Adonai, now Moses, and Moses, then Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not enjoyed your favor? That you have laid the burden of all this people upon me. Did I conceive all this people? Did I bear them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries an infant to the land that you have promised an oath to their fathers? Where am I to get me to give to all this people when they whine before me and say, give us meat to eat? I cannot carry all this people by myself, for it is too much for me. If you would deal thus with me, kill me rather, I beg you, and let me see no more of my wretchedness. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, uh, this question, how would you describe Moses' mood here? Uh, humanly angry. angry. Yeah, right? He, he is not a happy camper. He's exasperated. He's exasperated. Totally. Now, when you think of great leaders in history, right? When you think of great leaders in history, is this the kind of person that you would ascribe great leadership quality, someone who's reacting like that? Not usually. Not, not usually, right? What, what would you, uh, 
how would you describe it? Oh, sorry, not how would you describe it, but what what would you um, what would you uh, exasperation? But is that something that you think someone should have as a leader? Well, it's human. It's human, absolutely. But is that really, it, it may be human, but if someone reacts that way now, how would that, um, what would you think of that leader reacting? We understand it's absolutely human, but someone reacts that way. Basically, I've had enough of this expletive. Get me the, out of here. You deal with it. Kill me. I don't want to deal with it anymore. <laughs> if you heard your leader talking like that, how would you feel? But this is between Moses and God, right? He's not speaking like this in front of everyone. No, he's not. Yeah. No, he's not. So his boss. He's talking to his boss. But if your supervisor heard you talk that way, right? <laughs> I go to Rabbi Kamens and I say, I, Rabbi Kamens, I got it. These people are driving me insane. I can't deal with it anymore. They ask all these inane questions during my Parsha class. It's driving me, no, just kill me. I don't want to deal with it anymore. And he would say, he's going to think, he's going to be like, whoa, you, Rafi, you do say that. Just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> True. I do. Right. He might say something like, maybe you need a holiday, <laughs> but no, no problem. You deal with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At the very least, it's, um, it's not instilling confidence, right? It's not instilling confidence. So be that as it may, it, it, and it's also very interesting. Why does the Torah include not only this episode, but uh, sorry, not Moses' reaction. I mean, but I mean, other times that Moses loses his cool. Why? Why would we include that here? To show that he's human. Someone yeah. said that before. You're absolutely right. Right. Our our um, our leaders, our 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 models, our 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 forefathers, our ancestors, our mothers, everybody. They're very very human in the Bible. Right. Yes. They are very, it's, 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 uh, they're meant to be someone we can aspire to. And if you have someone who is so uh, out of rail, out of reach, then how can you even come close, right? How can you even come close to approaching that behavior it becomes in its own way off-putting, right? You, there's, there's no way you can approach that level of behavior. We see the follies of our ancestors in, in their best and their worst, right? We used to say in the Navy, uh, what was unique about ministry in the military is that in shul, like take it or like I see most people on Shabbat and that's it on their, we would call on their Sunday best, right? You may be having a rubbish week, but you come to shul, you put a smile on, you put some nice clothes on and that's fine. But when you live with your troops or your congregation out in the field or whatever, you see them at their Sunday best and their Wednesday worst. You see everything. And that's what the Bible is putting on display for us. Not just in this episode, um, but it's saying that, hey, Moses is human and he's having a rough time and he's having a bad day and he blew up. But he's very specific um, in, in his uh, threats. Um, and by the way, we're going to, oh, this is what I wanted to, we're going to come back to this, okay? Right? I cannot carry all these people by myself or it's too much for me, okay? So Moses, he, and he's also like, I can't deal with it. So I've been quoting it a lot because I've been studying it a lot. It's, it's a fantastic commentary. So now, if you remember the sin of the golden calf, right? What happens there? How does Moses react there? It's very different. He says, see how far removed these words of Moses are from those he uttered after the deed of the golden calf. Now, this is the quote. Now, if you will forgive their sin, well and good. But if not, erase me from the record which you have written. Meaning... I don't want to, if you're not going to forgive that they messed up, these are my people. If they messed up, fine, okay. But if you don't forgive them, I don't want, it's, this is on you, not me. I have, I don't want any part of this if you're not going to forgive them. Moses is going to bat for the people. He's really trying, and this is a whole uh, story that he goes up to Mount Sinai another 40 days after he's come down for after the first 40 days to beg God's forgiveness. And then God grants the forgiveness. Um, and then Moses goes back up uh, another 40 days and gets a second tablet, right? But Moses is really intervening, really, really intervening with them. Here, his anger brought him to sin and that he spurned his mission in office of the people of the Lord with which he had been entrusted. 
This constituted somewhat presumptuous conduct vis-a-vis -vis his creator. For who would say to his earthly sovereign, take your appointment in office in which I have no desire? All the more so in this case when he's talking to the sovereign creator. Meaning, th this is, right, this is <clears throat> horrible behavior for Moses right here. But couldn't yeah. it just be seen as a tactic? He's trying a different tactic this time. So yes, with um, the golden calf, he took the high moral ground. Well, he was also very new in the job, right? Yeah. This but, is after two years, right? Like you can yeah. be like, yeah. So like, if you guys were annoying me only in the first week of partial class, fine, okay. But now we're like two months into this. I'm like, oh my God, right? <laughs> right, this is two years worth. And, yeah. and Moses is very specific, right? A different tactic. It's like, yeah, just kill me. I don't want to deal with this anymore. <laughs> and it worked, right? Because he, he achieved <laughs> Well, but this is interesting because we're going to get to did he did it actually work or not, right? But it's 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 like you wouldn't talk to a king that way, no. and certainly wouldn't talk to God that way. Yet Moses, it, it seems like Moses gets away with it, or does he? Right. So it's it, Mo, uh, Isaac Arama saying he sinned. Well, if Moses sinned, then why is he not punished? Right. And by the way, not only is Moses not even punished, his request is answered, as we're going to see in a little bit. His request is answered. So what does that mean? Does that mean Isaac Arama is wrong? Or is God just having a little fun with Moses? Like, what, what's going on here, right? Clearly, yelling at God is not a tactic that's designed to ensure a long and happy life, right? And yelling in that way, and I don't want to deal with this, and whatever. Like, just think about it in your, in your place of work. If you ever went to your boss and started yelling like that, how long do you think it's going to be that you stay employed? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing not very, well, it depends where you work. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing in most places. I mean, in the synagogue office, it happens all the time. But <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, Kathy's here. Hey, Kathy. Hey, how are you? We're great. <laughs> how are you doing? There's yeah. your Kathy. I'm okay. <laughs> Where's your video? Um, oh, I'll just put it on. Um, I miss everyone. She miss you too. Yeah, yeah I saw her. Uh, I saw you uh, uh, watching on Facebook Live. So I said, come join us here. Yeah. We can hear your contributions. Yeah. Oh, here you are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so if that's the case, he thought if, if he actually did sin, then he's not punished. And not further, not, even, not, only is he, not only is Moses not punished, what he asked for, I cannot carry all this, it's too much for me, he, his request is granted. So head-scratching moment, right? You come into the office, lose your cool, yell, scream, whatever, and say, I need a raise. And you get a raise. <laughs> so what's happening here, right? What does that mean? So... There's an episode that's that's in in a way similar to this, okay, um, with Samuel um, and the people going to him and asking for a king, okay. Now it's 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 over four chapters, so I'm only I've only I've I've taken the beginning and the end of it, okay. Samuel was displeased that they said, "Give us a king to govern us," right? The people are saying we need a king, and that's not something really that um, we Jews were supposed to have done. Um, God said a while ago, don't be like other nations. You don't need a king, right? You have me. You don't need an earthly king. If you're like, no, we want to be want, we want a king like other people. Okay, fine. So, and God said to Samuel, heed the demand of the people and everything they say to you, for it is not that you, it is not that you, right. It is not you. They have rejected. It is me. They have rejected as their king. Like everything else they have done ever since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and worshiping other gods. So they are doing to you. Heed their demand, but warn them solemnly and tell them about the practices of any king who will rule over them. And it goes on and on about, you want a king, it's going to, all these horrible things are going to happen and blah, blah, blah. And guess what? All those things actually end up happening. So at the end of this episode, well, the Lord has set a king over you. And that, who's the first king, by the way? Anybody know? King Saul. Hmm. Right? How'd that go? Hey. <laughs> Not, not that great, not that bad. It's only later when things, the wheels really come off the wagon, right? 
But the Lord has set a king over you. Here is a king that you have chosen that you have asked for. If you will revere the God, worship him and obey him and will not follow the Lord's command, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, well and good. Right? Means everything will be okay. So this is the model. And I'm just here to kind of, um, to, to the way this, the Bible says, and it's a few different places that this happened. This is just one of them. Okay. The person or the community, they fall short of the desired standard of conduct. The next thing that happens is the person or the community makes an unrealistic or an unjust demand. Then God, okay, God accedes to the, to the demand or the request, but in granting that request, it makes the, the, the request more challenging than the original one. And then if the individual succeeds, the success canceled out their previous failing, which ultimately proves to be a blessing. Okay, so in this case of Samuel, the people were not supposed to have a king, but they, they fall short of the demand because they keep misbehaving and they say, we need a king. We need someone to keep us in line. We need someone to help keep us um, uh, on our toes and also to unite us. So God says, fine, you can have that, but the king is going to be limited in power. The priesthood is not going to be part of the kingship. And you guys both, the king and the community, have to behave themselves or horrible things are going to happen. Now, that sort of kind of works, but not entirely. Um, so in this case, it's not an example of them f succeeding and proving to be a blessing. But let's look like what happened here, right? Moses charges, uh, God, sorry, God, uh, God charges Moses to lead the people uh, and to be the intercessor between them and God and to lead them and to give them, take them out of Egypt to the land of Israel, right? Moses falls a bit short and he makes this unrealistic demand. Carry, carry all the people by myself or it's too much for me. Okay, fine. So Moses, God says to Moses, gather for me 70 of Israel's elders of whom you have experienced as elders and officers of the people and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their place there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will draw upon the spirit that is on you and put it upon them. They shall share the burden, burden of the people with you and you shall not bear it alone. Cool. That's great. But. But. So what's the problem? What? Right? No. God grants a request. That's great. But where's the challenge? He's got to find 70. Mm. 70 people. Se mm. Right? He's got to find 70 people. One and teach them, and yeah, what else? They need to have a similar understanding, or they need to come to some sort of agreement. Sorry, I came in a bit late. Well, that's okay. They all be on the same page. I'm sorry, it's a. They need to be all on the same page in a way. So all the problem is, if the more people you have, the more disagreements you might have or debates. Yeah, that's it's absolutely true. People. That is absolutely true. What else could that be? Anybody ever work alone and then all of a sudden have to work with other people? To get them all to agree, mm. surely would be the difficulty. Right. Now, forget about working with one or two people. Moses now has to work with 70 other people. Okay? But even, let's, it doesn't matter, other people. Like, I know, I was working by myself uh, as a rabbi in England. I was a solo rabbi. I come here and I have a clergy team of four people, now five people, other people, right? That's not easy. That takes getting used yeah. to right? When you have only and unique access to God, now all of a sudden you have to share that. Yes. That hmm. perhaps, perhaps is a challenge. Can I want to ask you a question. Sure. Is it similar to when his father-in-law advises him when he's trying to judge and he can't cope with yep. all the judgments? and he gets other wise men to come in and join him? Is this a similar situation? Uh, not quite. <laughs> Remember when he has to raise What do you mean? When he has to raise his hands and um, there's, there's several incidents. One is where he gets help to raise his arms in the middle of a battle. And then yeah. another one 
when his father-in-law says, what are you doing, doing all these judgments on your own? If you only use the wise counsel as well, your life would be made easier. And in that case, Moses isn't complaining, is he? I can't remember. No, he's not complaining there. Um, his father-in-law is, it's, you know, it's almost the opposite. There, his father-in-law is telling him, um, what you, the thing that you're doing is not good. You're taking too much on yourself. Yeah. Um, and he proposes, uh, and it's interesting, in Exodus, in Parsha Yitro, it's Yitro who's the one who's proposing that, that judgment. Yes. Uh, the system of judges, excuse me. Later yes. on in Deuteronomy, Moses comes up with it. And it's like, wait, hang on a minute. <laughs> but yeah, it's not quite the same thing. Though. Okay. And what about when he was raising his arms, when he was exhausted? and he Yeah, that was in the battle. That was... Um, they, he, it, it, he didn't need the help, but his loyal aides, um, who was it? Joshua, not Joshua, Aaron and Caleb, maybe I can't remember now. Uh, they lifted his hand so they would prevail. Okay. So this is really the only case that's different. Um, in, the, for this situation, yes. Um, in, 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 there are other, like Jonah in the whale, right? Yes. But I'll be talking mm. Moses. Are oh, you talking only about Moses? <laughs> yeah. oh, I mean, yeah, Moses doesn't get eaten by a fish. That's true. But <laughs> that, that would not be, uh, yeah. Anyway, not a lot of fish swing around in the desert, I guess. Um, so I, I, I think that's the challenge that it is. So that, that is one, uh, that, that's the, the first half of, of this sequence, this story, right, is, is this, that Moses, he's having a bad day, right? Listen, all of us have bad days. It, it happens, right? It happens. Now, so let's look at what, hap what, what happens next, okay? Because now that's the challenge. Moses has to work with these other people. That, that's what's going to happen now. That's going to determine, according to that model that, uh, that we're talking about here in the Bible, so now the, challenge, the, the request is even more challenging. And so Moses has to succeed or else maybe he actually will get punished. So... And this is a beautiful sequence here about, and really kind of illustrates uh, Moses and his character. And it's, it's and it's Moses, it sounds, and, and you read it, it sounds like Moses has had a moment uh, to calm down and he becomes back to himself, right? So Moses went out and reported the words of the Lord to the people. He gathered 70 of the people's elders and stationed them around the tent. Um, by the way, the, the number 70 uh, is significant in and of itself. Um, any number seven or 70 uh, is, is signifying of something complete. Like seven days of the week is a cycle, a complete cycle. Uh, counting seven week, seven, seven times seven between Pesach and Shavuot, uh, the seven year cycle of the Jubilee, um, right? So se seven times the circling at the wedding. And it's seven is just a signal a significant of completeness. What about 770? Yeah, well, why do you think they picked that? <laughs> That's not a coincidence either, but we're not, <laughs> no, we are not talking about Chabad right now. <laughs> right? He gathered 70 of the people's elders and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him, to Moses. He drew upon the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. Now, I mean, a whole other um, conversation is, did Moses then lose part of that? And then, or is it just the same amount and they all get, it's, it's unclear, but that's next year's portion when we talk about this, right? And when the spirit rested upon them, they spoke in ecstasy, but they did not continue. Meaning it was a moment they had that access, they prophesied, they spoke in ecstasy, um, and, but it stopped. It was a one-time thing. Okay, now I'm done. Or maybe not like that, but whatever, okay? Two men, however, one named Eldad and the other one, Medad, had remained in the camp. Yet the spirit rested upon them. They were among those recorded, but they had not gone out to the tent. Bolded because we're going to come back to that. And they spoke in ecstasy in the camp. But what ha happens here? They spoke in ecstasy. Did they stop? It's not clear from the text. Matt, you're shaking your head. Did they stop speaking in ecstasy? Oh. They, they must have been it, it, if, it, uh, if, if it was reported that he, they were acting the prophet 
they had to surely have been. It, it's not clear, and it seems like the implication. Oh, that looked like they did stop because they have to. They're told to restrain them. My well, lord. Let's finish reading, right? Yeah. Um, a youth ran out and told Moses, saying, "Eldad and Medad are acting in prophet in the camp." And Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' attendant, uh, from his youth, spoke up and said, "My lord, Moses, restrain them." Hey, stop! They can't do that. But Moses said to him, are you wrought up on my account? Were that all the Lord's people were prophets that the Lord put his spirit upon them? Meaning, how would you, what, what, how would you describe that? Is well, that sorry. Is saying that's a good thing? It's a good thing, yeah? Yeah. Well, that's, isn't that what he's saying? That wouldn't, that yeah. wouldn't it be great if, if everybody felt that way or had that... The, uh, um, the ecstasy. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, this is a very, very good thing. Aren't they also really humble? Because they didn't go out and mm -hmm. volunteer, they stayed in the camp. So they're more modest? I don't know. Just wondering. They're, well, it, it's one of those, like, yes, we, we are... He, Moses is extreme. What, what is it? What is the only characteristic that we know about Moses? Humble. He's humble. That's the only thing we know, right? The only, only thing that we know. So here it's saying, hey, these guys are saying what? These guys are prophesying in the camp. Because first of all, where were they supposed to prophesy? Have this intense ecstatic experience? In the tent. In the tent. That's it. Are these two guys in the tent? No, they're in the No, they're in the midst of the of the people. They're 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 men of the people. Right? First of all. Second of all, this is a very cryptic thing, but they had not gone out to the tent. Well sorry, and, were and they, they, were they, they, remained, they, they remained in the camp, they did not go out to the tents. Were right? they two of the seventy? Well, this is an interesting question. Are they two of the seventy? Or was the because here it's the way you read it here, it hmm. seems like he drew upon the spirit that was and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, these guys are in the tent, right? Mm -hmm. Right. These guys are on the tent. These two guys, Eldad and Medad, remain in the camp. So mm -hmm. are they actually part of the 70? No, they'd be extra. It, 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 <laughs> I got the extra. It, it, seems, it, seems, it, seems, it yeah. seems like these are extra. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Very good. And further, if you look here in the Hebrew, right? Um, or and neviim. So, this is verb, right? The verb of prophesying, right? Acting the prophet. But here it's a noun. They are prophets. So it's very interesting that the boy says in, in one uh, in, in one uh, uh, tense or one way of describing it. Moses answered in a different way, right? So, and Moses is saying, hey, this is actually a good thing. I would love people to act this way. I want everyone to be that way. So, mm. what's going on? There's a couple different questions that we need to de deconstruct a little bit of the mess that this story... On the surface, it seems really simple. Were they worried about him losing authority? Who? Oh, the people... Um... Oh, Dad, and uh, no, uh, sorry, um, Joshua. Yes, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, yes. So it seems like Joshua was sticking up for his leader, saying, hey, Moses, these guys are usurping you. They're, 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 they're taking over your role of, being, uh, of speaking to God, right? That's yeah. not okay. You can't do that. that. That's not allowed to happen. But in this case, it's okay. Because Moses says, no, 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 no. This is actually a good thing. I am encouraging this. I want people to be able to have that. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look a little bit about what's going on here, okay? Understand? Yes. Matt, Anna, we're all good. You guys are, as usual, very quiet. <laughs> Anna, I can't even see your face. You're off the screen. There you go. You're smiling. You're talking to you. <laughs> Fantastic. So two men left behind so again we're not clear if they are part of the 70 or not so let's look in the talmud okay 
we learned in another place, right? The, apropos the, uh, the appointment of the elders by Moses, the Gemara discusses an additional, as, additional aspects of that event. There were 72 candidates for elder, but only 70 were needed. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. How do we get this? <laughs> Let's look and see, because it's actually, yeah. they're not just pulling out a number from wherever. It actually makes sense, right? They were chosen by lots with their names put into a box. The sages taught, the verse states, and there remained two men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the other name was Meldad, and this, okay, well, this is the quote, okay, who are among those who went written, but they're not going to the camp. So where, where did they remain? Some say, right, Yeshom Rim, some say, this means they, i.e., their names remained ex excluded from those selected from the lots in the box, right? So not them physically, but their names on the box, the, the, the names that they put in the thing so they could be drawn by lots, right? The Baraita explains, and the Baraita is a Tanaitic, it's, it's the earlier rabbinic statements that were not included uh, in the Mishnah, but they were arguments that were recorded and the rabbis do lean on them from time to time. Um, but they're not quite as, um, they're not quite as, um, um, whatchamacallit, they're not quite as, uh, as um, respected. Respected, right? They don't carry quite as much weight. They don't carry quite as much weight. So, what does it say there? Uh, the bright says, at, at the time that the Holy One he said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, Moses says, Okay. How shall I do it? All right now, this is Moses saying, "How am I going to do this?" Now you're going to see the problem, right? Yeah. Right? If right, you got to do this. If right? <laughs> so you, you got to learn this. This is very important. Okay, yeah. this is how we teach. If we just thought, <laughs> you do that. If right, and they're gonna they're, that Matt, perfect, very good. Right? <laughs> if I select six from each tribe, from each and every tribe, there will be a total of seventy-two, which will be two extra. But mm. If I select five, but if I select five from each and every tribe, there will be a total of 60, lacking 10. And, <laughs> if, and now I'm running out of thumbs, right? <laughs> and if I select six from this tribe and five from that tribe, I'll bring about envy between the tribes as those with fewer representatives will resent the others. You see the problem? Mm -hmm. 72 would have been perfect, right? Yeah, the would have been perfect. Those of us with, with, you know, with siblings, you know exactly what this is all about, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So what did he do? He selected six from every tribe and he brought 72 slips to Dakin, right? On 70 of them, he wrote elder and he left two of them blank, he mixed them and placed them in the box. He then said to the 72 chosen candidates, come and draw your slips. Everyone whose hand drew up a slip, they said, Elder, he said to him, Heaven has already sanctified you. And everyone whose hand drew up a blank slip, he said to him, The omnipresent does not desire you. What can I do for you? Okay? That's one explanation of how we got to this number. Okay? Then there's an intervening um, discussion that wasn't really relevant. Um, then this is important. Rabbi Shimon says, Eldad and Medad remained in the camp, as they did not want to come to the lottery for the elders. At the time that the Holy One blessed be, he said to Moses, gather for me 70 elders, Eldad and Medad said, we are not fitting for that level of greatness. We are not worthy of being appointed among the elders. The Holy One blessed be, he said, since you have made yourselves humble, I will add greatness to your greatness. Mm -hmm. And what is that? You understand? That yeah. they were so mm -hmm. humble, in essence, and it's, and it's a way, I think it's a direct... Um, it's, it's a direct um, allusion, I suppose, to Moses, right? That they're being humble. Moses is humble, right? Notwithstanding, right? Uh, notwithstanding Moses' sort of freak out before, they're, they're being humble, okay? So the Holy One Blessed Be, he said, since you have made yourselves humble, I will add greatness to greatness. And what is the greatness that he added to them? It was 
uh, it was that all of the prophets, meaning the other elders who were given prophecy, prophesied for a time and then stopped prophesying. They prophesied and did not stop. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's a huge, 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 huge difference. But there is one confusing thing, because they're saying there that they didn't even take part in the lottery. So how does that fit with the first interpretation? Because then well, it's a totally different interpretation. Yeah. So here and that's why they're they're in between here. There there is a, a couple paragraphs of you know in the way that Tama does. Well, we're gonna talk about some random stuff and oh and by the way, back to what we were talking about, right? <laughs> okay. I mean somewhat related, but in the interest of brevity, I, I kind of took oh, that's fine. Okay. So it, it's it's really it's yesh shomrim that means some said this and Rabbi Shimon says this. This is a different, a totally different interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if that's the case, and by the way, most commentators accept this one. They really do like Rabbi Shimon's idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, not not so much the yesh shomrim. This one they really like uh, what they have to say here. Okay. Cool. So um, a barbanel. He comments on this. Our sages have already related that Moses selected six elders from each tribe, making 72 in all, in order not to sow envy between the tribes. Eldad and, right? That, that's, he's directly summarizing. Now he's going to make his point. Eldad and Medad, knowing that God had only commanded the appointment of 70 in their humility and so as not to shame the two who would not be chosen remained of their own free will in the camp and did not come to the intent of meeting with the rest of the elders, right? They were being humble. They didn't want to show anybody else up. They didn't want to cause a problem. And they said, you know what? We'll, we will remove ourselves from the running here. The Holy One, blessed be he, does not withhold just reward from his creatures. These two worthies reward with prophetic bounty for their action and not coming to the tent of meeting. Okay? Okay. They took two for the team. They took two for the team. But the idea here also, um, the idea here also uh, is, is that... Um, they were rewarded for their humility? Or? Yeah, they were rewarded for their humility, but they were also... Um, so this the question is, if they were rewarded for their humility, then why is Joshua telling them to be quiet? What's going on there? Jealousy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's exactly right. He's jealous, but jealous of who? Of, jealous of his position? Not Joshua. He's jealous for Moses' sake. And his position as regards Moses. I mean, because exactly right. So important to exactly him. right. He is worried that it's going to undermine Moses, right? Um, and, 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 and it's, because it, remember the idea is it's supposed to be the prophetic experience, the way it's described several times is that only in the tent of meeting, right? There, there's two different tents. You have the O.L. Moed, the, the tent of, of meeting and the, and the tabernacle, right? The Mishkan. And only in those two, and, and the tent of meeting, it says is, is set outside the camp that whenever God or Moses needs to, um, uh, have a conversation, Moses gets up, goes out of the camp, and has that experience. That's the only place that that should happen. These guys are doing it in the camp, amongst the people, right? And so, and, and only, by the way, the people authorized to speak, right? The 70 people that were chosen can have this experience. This is somebody else. This is totally different, right? Oops. That doesn't need to be there. Okay, so Again, with Akedat Yitzhak, he's saying, so he's commenting on this. In my view, the prophet's words on this occasion constitute a remarkable example of humility. Okay? A remarkable example of humility. Apart from not envying those who were his disciples and the work of his own hands, right? As alluded to in Sanhedrin, a man envies everyone except his own son and disciple. All right? I'm not jealous of my son. I'm proud of my son. When he accomplishes things, I'm very proud of him. Um, my students, when like a bar mitzvah student reads for the first time and does a beautiful job, I'm not jealous of him or her. I, I am proud of them. But when someone I don't know does a beautiful job leading services, <laughs> right, then I get jealous. Then I say, you're never leading services again or something like that. 
not not quite the case, but you understand the metaphor there. The idea is someone you've trained, you're going to have pride in what they do. Someone you have raised, like your child, you're not going to be jealous of them, or at least unless you're a psychopath. Like you should not be jealous of those two categories of people. However, anybody else, you should be. And so Moses should be by rights, by, by, by the human being that he is, right? He should be jealous. He should be jealous. Why is he not? He is, he is humble. He's, he, has, he exudes humility, right? He earnestly desired that all the people of God should be prophets and that the Almighty should bestow God's spirit upon them without him. Without Moses being a part of that, he wants the people to have this direct relationship with God, right? He doesn't want to be the intermediary. So, although this was a thing which every other, every, with, this was a thing which every other man, oops, sorry. If this was a thing that every other man would be jealous of, he did not display jealousy. He goes against his programming, right? Yes, safe. Question, are we talking about jealousy or envy? I was talking about the fact that he wants, I mean, not, not Moses particularly, but any other person in, in this position, would that be jealous or envious? As in, they want them to not have that experience and keep it to yourself, or you want to have the same as everybody else? Hmm, that's a good question. I think, yeah, it's not the same thing, is it? I think it's actually, I think in this case, it'd probably be a little bit of both. I think they're using that word here because he's using, it's the same uh, root. So I think he's using it um, in a way, perhaps not correctly, but a little bit in, uh, interchangeably. Um, this one's not my English translation. I copied this English translation. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I think reading the Hebrew, it's it's exactly the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, the same root. So I think he's talking about envy not jealousy. Okay. It's a good question though. So, um, and by the way, let's go back just a real brief. I want you to read this now. Okay. What is the problem here? Joshua or the boy is saying Eldad and Medad are acting the prophet in the camp. Right? The idea and the implication is you shouldn't be doing this in the camp. This is a big, big, big no-no. Right? Does Moses actually answer that accusation with his answer? He doesn't. Not really. No, he, he, not, not really. Not, not at all. Yeah. Right? Not at all. He, 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 he is saying... Yeah, the people are, they're, they're prophesying in the camp. And you read that, you really, you should be reading that as, that's inappropriate, right? Saif, there's a doctor performing surgery in the car park. Well, great, everyone should be doctors, right? Wait, hold on a minute, that, that's not, no, whoa, 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 right? There's a, there's a reason why you only have that prophesied by the tent of meeting, right? There's a reason why you perform surgery only in a sterile environment, Right? There's a proper place to do certain things and there's an improper place to do things. But he is answering it in a roundabout way because he's saying, um, don't worry about it. I want every, I wish everyone would behave. Mm. Like that. Yes. Yes. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. He, he is answering it. He's just answering it um, in, in, a, in a different way. And this is where we focus here on these two words, right? The boy is commenting on what they are doing. Moses is commenting on what he wants them to be. <laughs> right? You see the difference? It's subtle, but very, very powerful. Yeah. It's, it's a problem. Yeah, you, okay. You may be doing it in not quite the right way, but I want all of us to be able to do this. Yeah. I want all of us mm -hmm. to be able to have the capacity to have that direct relationship, okay? It's seen, it's seen the good in what's happening, I think. It's yeah. sort of a different perspective, isn't it? Right. He wants them to become prophets, just like he is. He is really, really interested uh, in in uh, in uh, in that. 
aspect of it. Okay, it's interesting that he didn't. Um, so he doesn't. It, he doesn't. And in in the classical Jewish way, he's answering a question, right? With a question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> we love that. So. It's and it's that idea, this beautiful idea, that it's not what I'm not worried about what they're doing. I'm worried about what they're going to become. And we see that in the book of Joel. After that, right after that, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young shall see visions. By the way, that's that. Uh, who sings that? And the years shall be vision. Who is it? Debbie Friedman, I think it is. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Right? She takes this song. So this idea is this, and Joel is prophesying about the coming. Joel is one of the minor prophets. Okay, and he's saying that I, I, I'm hoping, hopeful for a time when everyone, right, your sons and daughters, your old men and everybody, everyone will see visions. That's the vision. That's what we're hoping for. This is the vision of what. Moses is expanding on here. Don't be jealous of the experience that you do or don't have, but we all should elevate ourselves to get to that point. Right? And we'll finish this with a commentary, uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch. Well, we are shown that there is no monopoly of spiritual leadership, right? The spiritual powers granted by God are not the privilege of any particular office or status. The lowliest of the nation shares with the highest the opportunity of being granted divine inspiration. Okay? What is that? That is a very, very profound statement. Uh, right? What, what's he saying there? I think that uh, some democracy was already, this, uh, it was many years ago, so that's before BC and already had some democracy this time in the uh, Jewish society, maybe that's. Yeah, there, there, well, mm. it, it's, it's an egalitarian approach to that uh, mm. experience with the Almighty, right? Yes. It's not reserved for any one person. And this is, in, in many ways, I mean, it's, it's talked about in the Bible, but the rabbinic model of Judaism mm. really exemplifies this. It right? really puts an emphasis on, and that's why, by the way, the name of the, the, the spiritual leaders has changed from Kohen. Kohens and Levites. To teacher. Mm. Meaning, teach you how to do this but it's incumbent upon you to do it for yourself right i can't do it for you and yet Rafi, there is a monopoly with the koanim and the levine in what way or oh, the Torah. there is one in general you are a kohen or a levi and we're saying here that anyone can can have um spiritual leadership but nevertheless I can't do what a Kohen does or a, a Levi. Correct. So it's not complete. There's no, it's not it's absolutely not right. We're talking about leadership, though. But it's not complete. I, I'm denied still, even if well, I'm a there, leader. See, you're, you're, talk, you're confusing ritual mm. with this mm. prophetic experience with God. Okay. Yeah. Two different things. Okay. Yeah, because it's about, I mean, the spiritual powers rather than the leadership. It's that spiritual yeah. connection. But it's called leadership. So I'm just yeah. saying leadership's not complete. That's all. Well, yes. It, it's, it, when, when I'm saying spiritual leadership, what I mean is this, this experience with and that um, uh, the, 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 the profound uh, experience that you have with the Almighty. That, that's really what it's talking about. Yeah. Right. Don't don't confuse because the person going up, by the way, when you're going for the say the Kohen Aliyah in the temple or the synagogue, excuse me, you're doing that on behalf of the community. Right. And, and it's an allusion to our history of, of who those people would have been yeah. and what the role would have been. Right. But, but it, it's not. Um, it, don't don't confuse that with that they have greater access. No. But they do get greater honor in some ways, like being called to the Torah first. The, yes, but that's that's more of an illusion. Um, that's more of an illusion uh, of their history, okay. of their place in history. Okay? 
I think things have changed since the temple destroyed the second time around. Is that, is that how the whole rabbinic approach to Judaism sort of came about? Yes. Well, it, there was a few different revolutions that were happening at that time. Right? A few different. Uh, one of them was, that was uh, there, there were competing models, right? There were competing models of who and what was going to take over. And uh, rabbinic Judaism eventually won out. Yay. <laughs> Yay, Rabbi. <laughs> Go, Ruffy. That's right. I'm there. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. Any thoughts? No? Interesting. Excellent. We will see you all next week. It's been lovely to see you. I missed you guys last week. Same here. I, I logged in. I was thinking here, what's happening? Have I got the dates wrong? <laughs> you're, you're very, very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Rabbi. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.